Thank you very much, Jan. It's just absolutely wonderful to be here and have this opportunity to talk to you about genetics, which might be something a little bit new to some of you. Um, and the timing is wonderful because we were extremely excited to have a chapter in the World Happiness Report just recently um, that was exploring the biological basis of happiness. And today what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw out some of the uh, findings that we had in there um, and give you a few examples of some of the work that uh, we've been doing in my group to really move the genetics of happiness forwards. So when we are interested in understanding genetic and environmental influences on happiness or well-being, a really key method that we use is the twin design. So these are identical twins, and we can use the differences in how similar our identical twins are, who share 100% of their DNA sequence, and compare that to how similar our non-identical or dizygotic twins are, because they only share, on average, 50% of their genetic sequence. It's been an extremely popular and powerful method in the field, and it has allowed us to estimate the importance of genetic influences in creating these individual differences between us in well-being and a whole range of other traits. There have now been two wonderful meta-analyses about genetic influences on subjective well-being, um, and the results are shown here at the top. Um, they were published very, very close together by, by close colleagues, actually. Um, and you can see that the heritability of subjective well-being uh, and life satisfaction is in the range between 30 and 40 percent. That means 30 to 40 percent of the variation in the population is due to genetic differences between us. It's a really odd statistic, heritability, and it can take a little bit of time to get your head around it. Hopefully you've got it by the end of the talk. Um, at the bottom here is some results from, from my group, just to give you some context. If you're not familiar with genetic influences on um, psychological and behavioral characteristics, you can see that the uh, dark bar here tells us about the genetic influences on life satisfaction and happiness, and this is in adolescence. And you can see that the level of heritability is very similar to uh, the importance of genetic factors on traits like depression and anxiety. But what does it mean to find genetic influence on a trait? Well, one of the things it doesn't mean is that you are, have a fixed, deterministic level of happiness for your life. Um, actually, a lot of my research, my, my lab is called the Dynamic Genetics Lab, a lot of my research is understanding quite how dynamic our genetic and environmental influences are. So genetic influences are not fixed and they're not deterministic. The other really important thing to remember is that they're only part of the story. Right? In the uh, twin design, we're able to estimate two different types of environmental influences as well. So we can estimate what we call shared environmental influences, which make family members similar to one another, and we can estimate non-shared environmental influences, which create differences between people. And you can see that uh, environmental influences are crucially important for aspects of well-being. But if you had to summarise, you know, what does it mean to find heritability for well-being? And what it means is that for some people, it's just simply easier to maintain higher levels of well-being. What it doesn't mean is that you can't change your well-being. And I'm going to show you later on an example of how we've looked at heritability in an intervention study. So twin studies have been a really important method that we've used in the field. But for the last 10 to 15 years, there's been an, an increased focus on, instead of inferring genetic influence from uh, family uh, similarity, to go directly to DNA. And can we identify the specific variations in our DNA that are important in creating these individual differences in our well-being? This has been really difficult, <laughs> um, it turns out. So um, we, it's been an absolute global effort to be able to develop and refine the methods that we need to use to be able to identify the single letter changes. I'll refer to them as SNPs. It stands for single nucleotide polymorphism, but you can really just think about it as a single letter change in your DNA. Most of the large genome-wide association studies will focus on this type of genetic variation. And what we've learned is that we need samples, perhaps an order of millions of participants, and we'll be looking at one to two million variations across someone's genome to be able to identify the single letter changes that are important in creating these differences between us in well-being. 
So when we have a genome-wide association study, or GWAS, you hear people say, these are the kind of key results that we would get from the study. And they're called a Manhattan plot. Um, and when we, um, when we first started to do genome-wide association studies, it was completely flat. There was nothing popping out. It really wasn't anything like Manhattan. Um, but now, with more refined methods, um, we are starting to find and identify significant variations in our DNA that are associated with well-being. And these are two key um, uh, GWASs for subjective well-being. Jan was really involved in this one. I don't know if it brings him nightmares seeing it. Um, but um, in this first study up here, um, uh, uh, by Ockbe et al, um, uh, led by the Social Science Genetic Association Consortium, three uh, significant signals came out of the, the genome that were significantly associated with our well-being. In a more recent study, but using quite a different um, measure, there's now more than 200 SNPs that have been identified um, from DNA that are associated with well-being. But these estimates of genetic and environmental influence really just represent the starting point. And what I want to show you today is four ways in which my group has been trying to move these findings forward. How can we use this information that we now have about genetics to actually start to answer really interesting questions about the complexity of well-being in our lives? So this is a picture. Um, <laughs> this is a picture, and there's chromosomes here. And every single one of these dots represents a significant genetic association that's been found. We have found so many genetic associations for a whole range of traits that the computer program set up to generate this lovely image doesn't work anymore. Um, so this is actually completely out of date, which just shows you the amazing, um, amazing collaborative progress that we've made in the field of genetics to start to identify the variations in our DNA that matter. And so when you have hundreds and thousands of um, DNA variations that have been identified, how do you then use them in the studies? How, 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 can, how can you start to use genetics in your study? Well, we know that traits like well-being, complex behavioral traits, are likely to be highly polygenic. And what I mean by that is they're likely to be influenced by very many genes, but each have a very, very small effect. And so one of the ways in which we are starting to use this genetic information that's been derived from genome-wide association studies is to construct what we call polygenic risk scores. And it is simply a weighted composite of all of the SNPs that have been significantly associated with the trait. So there are some variations on that, but that's how you can think about it. It's a composite of genetic risk, or um, I'm quite a positive thinker, so kind of maybe genetic liability. And this is a study that was published this year where we've used this polygenic approach to understanding resilience to peer victimization. So we've used a polygenic risk score for both uh, depression and a polygenic risk score for subjective well-being. You probably want to focus a bit more on the right-hand graph here, but essentially what we're asking with this analysis is whether we can use genetic factors to predict who will be resilient to social and environmental stressors. So who is going to be resilient? On this graph here, we've got well-being on the y-axis um, and victimization on the x-axis. And you can see that victimization in adolescence um, is associated with well-being in young adulthood. This is at age 23. And you can see that the more victimization you get, the lower your well-being. In addition, you can see these lines separate the sample into the uh, polygenic risk score. Here, uh, the polygenic risk score for depression. Um, and you can see that there's an effect here. There's a main effect of both victimization on well-being and there's a main effect of the polygenic risk score on well-being. What we don't see here is an interaction effect. So in this particular example, we can't say that genetics is the reason why some people are more resilient than others. And so for resilience to peer victimization in adolescence, there are going to be other factors that we need to explore or we come back when we have refined our polygenic risk score further. But the point is that this polygenic risk score is just another variable that you can add to your data set now. So much hard work and global effort um, has gone into developing these polygenic risk scores. And now, in many of the samples that you use, 
you could request a polygenic risk score for depression or for well-being or, or for whatever trait you're interested in and combine that into your analyses. And I think there is real amazing potential to be able to incorporate that as an additional predictor. Now, the second example I want to talk to you about for my group is something that I'm really excited about, but that I found very, very difficult to do. And that's this idea of combining genetics with intervention science. Now, genetics generally needs really, really large sample sizes, and interventions tend to be on, uh, you know, large, but definitely on a much smaller scale to compare to the, the kind of samples that we need for, for um, genetics. So I did this initially by combining um, genetics using the twin design and an intervention study. So this was an intervention study for um, adolescents, 16-year-olds, and um, on the top left-hand side, you can see the results across the intervention. So um, we had different phases of the intervention where they did control activities, where they did the actual positive activities that were um, hypothesized to increase their well-being, and then we did a, a follow-up as well. And you can see that the intervention worked, which was wonderful. Um, so you can see that we, it, it's pretty flat while they're doing the control activities, and then we get this kick up in their well-being, albeit, you know, not huge, but there's some significant increase in their well-being in response to the positive activities. And that continues, it, it grows into the follow-up analyses. But what was innovative about this study, this twins well-being intervention study, was that it was with twins. And so we could decompose the variance in their well-being at different stages of the intervention to understand the dynamic um, way in which, which someone's genetic influences are playing out when their well-being is changing. And I think the single most important thing that you can take away from my talk today is in this slide, and it is that genetics is not a barrier to improving our well-being. It is not at all. You can see that the effects are completely different. So we can get mean effects shifting the whole population, the sample is the mean effect. Whereas what explains those individual differences between us largely remains as, as a genetic effect. And so that's what's shown here. We have genetic influences that are present at baseline and the size of the arrow tells you how consistent those genetic influences are across the intervention. So what we see is that baseline genetic influences are important and they continue to be important throughout the intervention. And actually, um, the way that we did the analysis tells us not only that baseline, that those same genetic influences are important for baseline well-being, they're also important for how people respond to the intervention. I think bringing individual differences to intervention science is a really important um, future direction, even if it is difficult to do. Um, and I think it can help us to understand why some people respond differently to interventions and therefore how we could use that information to understand the mechanisms of the intervention and perhaps the personalization of intervention to someone's particular genetic and environmental characteristics. The third example I want to show you from my group is um, thinking about how we incorporate the environment into these analyses. Now, I call myself a behavioral geneticist, and um, it kind of downplays the uh, importance that I feel the environment has, right? My title doesn't tell you, really, that I value both environmental influences and genetic influences. And what we need is those influences both in the same study to be able to, be able to really interrogate what's going on. So if we think about the traditional model where we, hopefully, you're now convinced that there are genetic and environmental influences on well-being. And then quite often what we think is, well, I'm interested in an environmental exposure or experience, perhaps life events. Um, and the traditional view is that we would think about life events being an environmental measure that is part of this variance that influences well-being. However, there's so much evidence in behavioral genetics to suggest that it's much more complicated than that. And it, it shouldn't really be a surprise that the etiology of well-being, such an important and complex human characteristic, is going to be um, complicated. So we can have genetic and environmental influences on well-being, and then we can have a look at how life events are associated with well-being. And we can say, well, actually, we find that if we put uh, a life events measure into a twin design, life events are heritable. Um, so the sort of average heritability of life events is 30%. It's really almost exactly the same heritability that we find for characteristics of mental illness and for subjective well-being. 
So what does it mean? I mean, life events aren't actually, genetic illnesses aren't directly having an effect on life events, obviously. Um, and so we need to think about, well, what does it mean to find genetic influence on life events? And the gene environment correlation model tells us that um, what is happening is that there are genetic and environmental influences on life events, and some of the genes that are important for life events are because of the effect that well-being has. The genetic influences on well-being are correlated with the genetic influences on life events. And so in this study, we set about to explore whether we could explain the genetic influence on life events with the genetic influences on well-being. And if we can, it gives us an idea about um, how our genetic influences are um, influencing us to construct the world around us. So uh, these are the results um, from the study, and they're a little bit complicated, so I'll take you through them. So um, we looked at a whole range of well-being and, uh, and associated positive traits. Um, and so those uh, different kind of positive traits are shown along here. And um, we looked at both negative and positive life events. So they're showing on your screen as red and blue. Um, and then uh, what I've plotted here is the proportion of the phenotypic correlation that's due to additive genetic influences. So what does that mean? So the degree to which there's a correlation between life events and um, aspects of well-being, how much of that is because of shared genetic factors? And you'll see that um, if we took an average across all of these different traits, that uh, on average, around half of the reason that life events and well-being are correlated with one another is because of shared genetic influences. And so this means that inheriting the propensity for positive traits might cause you to seek environments that lead to positive life events, and even to seek environments that lead to fewer negative life events as well. And the reason why we think it goes in that direction, um, so that it's your well-being traits that are leading you to um, seek out these different life events, is this really interesting finding here. And so um, this is uh, the results for gratitude, and this is the results for grit. And gratitude really, really stands out um, in our analysis. It's really completely different in very many ways in lots of the analyses that we do. Um, and here we've interpreted this as traits which drive behavior are more strongly genetically correlated. So traits that drive behavior like grit and ambition, they have a stronger genetic correlation than traits that perhaps follow behavior. So more reflective traits like gratitude. This makes us feel more confident that what we're seeing here is a true gene environment correlation, that someone's genetic propensity is uh, causing them to seek out environments where they are more likely to experience positive life events. And so these advances in genetics have really helped us to answer more of these complex questions about subjective well-being. So the fourth example uh, and final example I want to show you is how we have been using um, the advances, the new results that we've got from genome-wide association studies about the genetic influences that are important for subjective well-being to ask questions about causality. And here we do, uh, and many of you will be very familiar with an instrumental variable analysis, but here we're using genetic information as our genetic instrument to be able to reduce the bias that we might find from reverse causality and residual confounding. So we were interested to test a whole range of cardiometabolic traits, um, and they're listed uh, on the left-hand side here. And we were interested to test these because there's observational evidence that there's an association between these cardiometabolic traits and well-being. But there is, as yet, generally limited evidence about whether there is a causal pathway. Do these traits cause changes in our subjective well-being? And likewise, does subjective well-being change these traits? And of course, causality is a really important thing to establish if we want to develop effective and efficient interventions. The only uh, one of these variables which had, a, uh, had strong evidence for a causal pathway was from body mass index to subjective well-being. There was not strong evidence for any of the other cardiometabolic traits um, 
And so the reason why we might have seen those in observational studies before is likely to be due to residual confounding. We were really interested in this um, finding between body mass index and, and subjective well-being, and we were able to do a follow-up analysis in the UK Biobank study. And this allowed us to look at um, the different aspects of happiness and satisfaction that, that they have measured in that study. And we can see that the causal uh, pathway is driven, in this sample at least, by satisfaction with health. So the reason why body mass index causes subjective well-being is likely to be a psychosocial process rather than a biological process. So why are some people happier than others? Well, the short answer is that both genetic and environmental influences are both important in creating these individual differences between us. Mm -hmm. But I hope today I've shown you that four different ways in which we can move the science of genetics forward to ask these more interesting questions about the complexity in well-being. And that's by including polygenic risk scores in our analyses. Um, it's by uh, combining genetics and intervention, thinking about um, gene environment interplay. And I really have only scratched the surface of the interesting things that you can do in terms of gene environment interplay. And finally, it's using these advances in genetics to answer really interesting questions about causality. And that will lead to better interventions. So what can you do? I think there are two really important ways in which a really clever bunch of people like you could really influence what we're doing in genetics. The first single most important change that we could uh, benefit from in genetics is a consensus in how to measure well-being and how to uh, distinguish between different aspects of well-being. And the second way is to find a way for us to really truly foster collaborative work to study these genetic effects within the context of social and economic factors. Thank you very much. Thank you, that's absolutely fascinating. I wanted to ask about your conclusion that the satisfaction with health due to BMI is a psychosocial, um, potentially, you know, because isn't the satisfaction with health a combination of your expectation about what your health should be and what it actually is? Um, and not just, you know, do you see what I mean? So you should be unsatisfied with your health because, you know, you can't walk or, you know, you can't get out of bed or whatever. And that could be the causal pathway for you then reporting lower satisfaction in life. Yes, yes. I, th I think there are lots of um, ways in which we need to unpack what's actually driving that uh, causal pathway. And we were limited by the measures that were available um, to really uh, try to unpack that. But I think what it shows is that it's not having its effect through the more um, hedonic aspects of well-being, and it's perhaps not having its effect through perhaps more biological factors um, and health factors. Um, and so it might be having its effect through stigma or through yeah the perception that um, you're doing worse than you should do in terms of your health. But yeah. I. I say psychosocial very broadly there. Um, yeah, I think we need to unpack it a bit more. Thanks, that was really interesting. So on the use of genetics for polygenic risk scores and Mendelian randomization efforts to determine causality, can you say a little something about the um, strength of the instrument and what happens if you don't have a very strong instrument and the problem with inferences that could arise? And then a second question is, uh, my sense is that many of these polygenic risk scores even so far have been developed on majority white populations. And so what are some of the issues if you're trying to apply some of this work to more diverse populations? Two excellent questions. So um, the strength of the instrument in Mendelian randomization is really, really crucial. And I think one of the main reasons why we don't find the causal pathway between subjective well-being leading to body mass index is because the well-being instrument um, is not a very strong instrument. In fact, the instrument that we used there was the, the three well-being SNPs. Um, uh, and uh, there have been new genetic variants identified and we need to repeat the analysis. Um, and so I was very careful because there's, there's, there's strength of evidence for the causal pathway between body mass index and well-being, but there isn't as yet strong evidence of a causal pathway from, from well-being to body mass index. And we absolutely, you know, as we do in all instrumental variable analysis, have to be very careful about the, the strength of that instrument. What we also find in doing Mendelian randomization studies for 
more behavioral and social characteristics is that we need to be especially careful about pleiotropy. Um, and so uh, there are various different sensitivity tests that we can do in an MR study to be able to test whether we think it's actually pleiotropy. So the fact that genetic factors might be influencing both of the um, variables in our study. Um, and I'm lucky. I'm at the University of Bristol, which is the best place in the world for doing Mendelian randomization. So um, I've been guided by some, some great people, and I, and, and I think there's real um, potential for using this. As we identify more and more SNPs from the genome-wide association studies, those genetic instruments are only going to get better and better. And your second question, I've forgotten. Oh, yes. So you're absolutely right that um, genetics has a... A, a very strong history of um, only including uh, white Caucasian Western uh, samples in their analyses. That was done for the kind of very good statistical reasons at the start, but there is a wonderful movement now in terms of um, increasing the diversity in genome-wide association studies. And we're finding that increasing the diversity is actually also improving um, the number of hits that we get. Um, as, as I think you would predict, actually, increasing the diversity. Um, and it's also meaning that um, the results can be applicable to many more people. It's a really important um, movement within genetics at the moment to increase the diversity. So we need people to fund the genotyping of diverse populations. A final question, one up here. Thanks, this is really interesting. Um, I have a question about whether there's a conceptual difference between subjective well-being and what maybe you could call like organismic well-being. So presumably our genetics have evolved under pressure to help us flourish in some way. Um, and then subjective well-being is, this, is, a, is a kind of different way of thinking about what's good for the individual. Um, is there any danger in um, kind of thinking about ways of using genetics to improve subjective well-being that lose sight of the organismic foundations for those genetic properties. So for example, um, if, if you're really working on getting people to have a good mood response or a good life satisfaction response to life events, um, and then you don't take into account how a, a, a different kind of response might lead in the long run to something that's more organismically favorable, is there, is there any kind of tension in that? I don't know that there's been... Um a lot of research on that topic, but I think it's I think it's really important to remember that um, one that the importance of genetic influences can change across the lifespan and in different environmental contexts. That different genetic factors might be important um, in, in different futures of the human population. Right? Um, I mean, that's what's been driving evolution, um, and so the, the the single biggest impact of that is that once we've done the genome-wide association study, it's not the end. We actually need to reiterate, we need to go round and round uh, in terms of identifying what are the genetic factors that matter now in this particular population, in this particular environment. And I, that doesn't quite answer your question, but that's the kind of thinking um, where genetics is going. We need to be much more dynamic. These aren't genes for happiness. That's not the way that... It, um, it works. Um, and so um, understanding a bit more about the mechanisms between those um, genetic factors and, you know, human behavior is, is, is something that you can do to understand that. But also just accepting that these are going to be really dynamic um, and we're not going to get a final set of genes that are, are important for something. We're going to have to um, reevaluate that as the human race develops. Thank you very much. <laughs>